Hello and welcome back to lesson number nine. This one is about debugging. Debugging is something that we all have to do as programmers at some point in our careers. At some point, we will encounter code that doesn't work as we think it should. At this point, we need to investigate it, we need to go through it, we need to work out what's wrong, and ideally, fix it. Or, if we can't do it, identify it so that someone else can fix it. To do this, we need to do what's known as debugging. Now, debugging is a very complicated process, and everyone develops their own way of dealing with things. However, we have developed a five-step process which you can apply to debug your own code. First thing to do is to make sure that you uh, know exactly what the code is supposed to be doing. This is a big thing. Know what your code is supposed to do, because normally when you're working with code, you expect it to behave in a certain way. But should it behave that way, work out exactly how it should be behaving, then compare it with what's actually happening, and hopefully that will uh, make it clear what's going wrong. The next step is to make sure your code fails every time. One of the worst things you can have with a bug is a bug that only fails some of the time. If it's on and off, that can be very problematic because you can't identify the cause behind why the bug is uh, happening. Once you've got it failing every time, then you can work on making it failing fast. So failing fast is actually surprisingly important, and you'll notice this if it doesn't fail fast when you're trying to get it to fail every time, because you'll often want to run the code many, many times to try and see if the changes you've made have affected anything. In those instances, you don't want to be waiting very long, a few seconds at most, to uh, for your code to fail again, so you can know this attempt didn't work, let's go back, try again. If it's taking, say, 20 minutes for your code to run, that can be a real pain, and it's a very hard thing to work with. So, make your code fail fast. Next up is to change one thing at a time. So this is, again, when you're editing the code, you go through, your code's failing fast, it's failing every time, you can think, oh, maybe this variable should be this, or it should behave like this. Make a small change. Make one a change. Then run it again, see if it's worked. Then change another thing. See, run it again, see if it's worked, and so on. One thing at a time. Don't change multiple things, because if you do fix it, you'll have to go back and check which one was the thing that fixed it in the first place. And the fifth step is to keep track of your changes. This can be for on your notepad or in your head for small debugging sessions, but if you're doing a larger one on a massive shared code base, you might want to use a version control system like Git to keep track of what you do through commits. And then if, at the end of all of this, your code still isn't working, do not be afraid to ask for help. Be humble. Go and talk to people. Just explain your code to them. Talk to a colleague, talk to a co-worker, email somebody, ask somebody on Teams. Whatever you need to do, ask for help. That can even mean Googling the problem. Take the error you've got, Google it, look things up online. Do as much as you need to do to get the problem solved. We can't all answer every single bug that we come across. Somebody out there has probably done it already. Ask for help. There is another option as well, one that's become particularly popular in recent years, which is rubber duck debugging. Rubber duck debugging is quite a simple method of debugging. It's one that is quite easy to do. Anyone can do it. All you need is a rubber duck or some other inanimate uh, anthropomorphic thing that you can talk to, that you feel comfortable talking to. Someone who doesn't know anything about code also works. A child, small, old, doesn't matter. It could be your partner, it could be a spouse, but they probably have less time, so maybe it's not going to work out with that. But the idea is you have somebody or something you can talk to, that you're happy talking to, that will listen and not say anything. Rubber duck debugging is a surprisingly effective technique, and it consists of acquiring this thing you're going to talk to, and then talking to it over a period of 
a few minutes maybe, describing each bit of your code line by line. You say, okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about a few things. Explain to your object what you want to do. And then you say, okay, this line of code, this is doing this. This whole piece of code in general is for this purpose. It solves this problem. This function does this bit of that problem. And then this line here, this line means this. This line means this. And you explain the code bit by bit. And at some point, you're going to tell the duck about a piece of code. You're going to say, this does this. And then you're going to look at it, and you're going to see that, ah, actually, that was a lie. It doesn't do that. It does something else. At which point, the duck will be happy and serene, and it helps. It did the job. And this is very much the principle behind rubber duck debugging. Now, I don't use a rubber duck as much as I would like one. I have this octopus here, reversible octopus, that I use. He's very good, and you can see he's a bit unhappy. However, once I'm done, he's reversible, and... He becomes... He becomes much happier once he's reversed. And then he just sits next to my computer, and I explain code to him whenever I need to. You may have even seen him in some of my backgrounds when I've been on Teams calls. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's go for an example. I have written this function, fizzbuzz and cars. Now, it doesn't quite work yet. Let me show you. So if I feed in the number 13, we're getting the number 13 back, which isn't right. Shouldn't be doing that. If I feed in number 15, we're getting 15 back. If I feed in number 20, we're getting 20 back, which is also not right. So what's going on? This is the point at which we need to start debugging it. So first things first, what should it be doing? Okay, so fizzbuzz and cars, this is a function that does fizzbuzz, so it's one, two, three, five, one, two, three, four, five, etc. But instead of replacing multiples of three and five with fizz and buzz, it does that, but also it should replace any, or it should add on fizz or buzz for any number that has those numbers in. So for example, 13 is not divisible by three or five, but it has a three in it, so that should be fizz. 15 is divisible by three and five, and has a five in it, so that should be fizz buzz buzz. You see, and at the moment it's not returning fizz buzz at all, so something is wrong. Uh, but it's quite good because it's happening every single time, and it's happening consistently. So let's go and change something. Okay. So we look through the code. What should we change? Let's employ the rubber duck technique. So, so I'm saying, okay, we're setting the result to be a blank string. Then I'm going to say, if our number that we've supplied is divisible by three, then add fizz to the result. Otherwise, if the number is divisible by five, add buzz to the result. Then I'm going to iterate over every character in the string version of the number. And if the character is equal to three, we add fizz to the result. And if it's equal to five, we add buzz to the result. Then we say, if the result is true, we add result to number. Ah, this isn't right, because what we're saying is if the result is fizz or buzz, the result is assigned to be the number, which is interesting. So what that means is that if we were to call fizz, buzz, and cars, on something like seven, we get an empty string back because seven is neither divisible by three or five, and nor does it contain either of those numbers. Right, so what we think we need to do here is we need to say not result. Because what we're saying is that we want to return the number if none of these conditions are true. So at the moment, we're actually just overwriting it if we do and doing the reverse. So let's try this again. Okay, now fizz buzzing cars 7 returns 7. 13 is returning fizz. 
15 is returning fizz buzz. Hang on a minute. This should be returning fizz buzz buzz. So something is still wrong. Let's have a look again. Let's go through this again. Okay, so if the number divided by 3 is equal to 0, result plus or equal to fizz. Otherwise, if it's divisible by 5, plus or equal to buzz. And then, okay, so the code looks fine. What's going on? Let's, let's make a change. Maybe if we wanted, we could do another else if for number divisible by 3 and number divisible by 5. How about this? Then we have result plus equal to fizz buzz. Let's try this. So we've made one change. No, it's not working. And then if we go back and look, and let's check out why. So we've got results, it's just setting it to the empty string. And we're saying if it's divisible by three, then we do fizz, and then the rest is ignored. If we do it divisible by five, then buzz, and the rest is ignored. But if we do divisible by three and five, it's fizz buzz. But if it's either divisible by three or five already, this will never get called. Hmm. So that's just not being called, that's doing nothing. Ah, well, what if you see numbers being divisible by 3 is equal to 0, but we're saying else if. Both of these could happen at the same time. What if this was just an if statement on its own? Would that work? Ah, okay, now as you see, we now we've got fizz buzz buzz. Very good. Let's try 33. This should be fizz 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 because it's got two threes in it and it's divisible by three there we go seems to be working that's essentially how you do debugging uh, and these are some quite contrived examples but that's for the purpose purpose of demonstration all right have a go at the exercises and see how far you get